Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello to you, listener. I hope you are ready to feel seen, inspired and supported in the epic journey that is business ownership and all of the self-mastery that comes with it. And you're about to hear my chat with the wonderfully warm and incredibly engaging Michelle Cox. Just background fun fact, Michelle and I crossed paths but never met in my time at Tourism Tasmania uh, when I was their content marketing manager and she was on their board. And so many people said, have you met Michelle? You'd love her. But I never did. And uh, now I know why they said we'd get along between the love of marketing, podcasting, being multi-passionate, ceramics and saying it exactly how it is for the greater good. There is little opportunity to imagine that we'd run out of conversation that I hope is going to be in incredibly valuable for you too. You'll hear me mention this in the intro, but Michelle has a portfolio career, her own businesses in different industries and board roles. It's diverse and interesting and such a valuable way of looking at what we build for our unique selves. And this chat, it goes beyond the what, why and how of business. It might even in some parts feel a little bit different to some of our other conversations, but it really delves into the understanding of self that develops along the way to help you become the person capable of achieving all that you wish to in your business your own way. It's just so great. She's such a gem. She interviewed me for her podcast too, One Question, and pushed me in all the very best ways to open up. So after you finish this ep, make sure to give that a listen as well. But today on this episode of Unemployed and Afraid, you're about to hear about owning when you don't know something for the benefit of you and for others. Learning on the go at all levels, like well beyond the startup phase, just learning as you move, letting your contribution be your guiding light for the actions you take, our relationships to money, our very personal relationships, the balance of multi-passions with a desire for a laser focus, and the role of self-awareness and presence in the growing of your business. There is so much to love here. I would love to hear what you think about it. Let's get into the chat. I'm here with Michelle Cox, podcast host, author, speaker, board director, and ceramist. But honestly, that doesn't even begin to cover the scale of this gal's professional world, which is a curious mix of business and creativity that is right up my alley, listener, and I bet yours too. But do strap in for this one. She's had an extensive career in the travel and tourism industry that's seen her in the C-suite for the likes of APT Travel Group and SDA Travel and has held roles on the boards of BSA Limited and Tourism Tasmania, that beautiful state, plus more that I'll share in a moment. But as a fellow entrepreneur at heart, she's also started a number of companies. She's founded the Lynchpin Company, a travel, tourism and hospitality consultancy that still exists today in 2012, then stepped into the communications industry, starting up the Sydney office for Marcom's agency Bassion Collective as a shareholder and board member. She then created Wabi Sabi Studios in 2019, which carries the wonderful One Question with Michelle Cox podcast and multiple books that she has written, including the titles It's Okay Not to Have Kids, Doctors Are Not Gods, and Death Doesn't Have to Be Morbid, all of which I will be reading in the upcoming downtime of my life. And she's the creator behind Flung Ceramics. Listener, I think you can see here while I was so excited to talk to Michelle, a range of beautiful ceramic homewares. Plus, she has a maker's studio in North Avalon in Sydney, Atelier 9. I'm not done. She is non-executive director on the board of ASX Listed Experience Co., Chair of the charity Motherless Daughters Australia, which is the leading organisation for research, awareness and support around mother loss. I almost need to catch my breath after that. She describes her work as something I absolutely love, a portfolio career, which means doing lots of fun and interesting and varied things every day with 11 sources of income. And she is sharing her experience in moving beyond the standard corporate career to have a life of financial flexibility and fulfillment to challenge our traditional point of view on how we earn an income. Speaking our language, what an expander. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. 
married Michelle Cox. I'm exhausted just listening to that, Kim. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a bit hard when someone reads it back to you, but uh, it's lovely to be here and just gorgeous to meet you. Thank you. Absolutely likewise and um, exhausted in the very best of ways. I, I would also say exhaustion is interchangeable with inspired in that sense. But to kick us off, I want to get a little bit behind the bio with you and understand how your husband might describe you. Oh, that's a scary uh, start. We've been together 23 years and my husband is 20 years older than me. So uh, when I met him at 29, people thought, you know, what the heck were you doing? Uh, you know, why wouldn't you find someone your own age? But it's a beautiful partnership and we are very different. So he would describe me as probably a bit of a maniac, if I'm honest, um, and a positive, forever optimist. You know, this like positivity and optimism is a big part of who I am, despite the challenges I've gone through in life. And he and I have had lots of challenges um, health-wise, both independently. Yeah, energetic, very entrepreneurial. That's That's been a, something that's always used for me, even as a young kid. I was always trying to, you know, I came from no money, so... I was always trying to hustle, try and find ways to buy the the latest fashion 501 jeans or something that I couldn't afford. So I was like, how can I, um, you know, make money, make create something to, uh, you know, get the money to get the things. Very, very loyal. I'm sure he'd say I'm a very good friend. I'm very loyal and um, passionate. I'm a, a massive empath as well. And uh, yeah, very loving. I love hard, you know, I'm um, have lots of, I don't have a big family because I've had a lot of loss in life but my friends and my family. So they are very dear to me and love them hard and they, you know, love me back, which is nice. It's wonderful to have a partner like that on your side when you are going through the process of exploring yourself, be it through health or business or anything else. Uh, so that's a really lovely. Thank you for sharing. I tried to cover some of your impressive bio in the intro, but I know there is so much more to your career. So before the Michelle, who I've had the pleasure of meeting today and the listener does too, and your 11 revenue streams, who were you? I was a pretty active kid. I think uh, it was interesting. I was talking with a friend. I've just been on a retreat in New Zealand and we were discussing how the increase of um, ADHD diagnosis in older women. I think my mum recognised that I was probably ADHD or ADD uh, in those days early on and she enrolled me in any and every sport possible and I have an older brother who's very cool and calm and casual <laughs> and I came along this bouncing bloody ball thing, you know, causing havoc wherever I go. And so mum, you know, in the days in the seventies, when I grew up in Cotty's cordial, the red coloring and the green coloring that we all had, she realized pretty quickly that when I had that, I was literally bouncing off the walls. So I was taken off all that stuff. I wasn't allowed to have, you know, red and green frogs and things. So I was a pretty energetic kid and which then made me be, you know, highly successful in lots of sports and athletics. So I was a school captain at school, very, um, you know, loved I love school, but I, I don't think school was for me, probably because of the attention span challenge. Super smart, but, you know, couldn't sit still. And so that didn't, like teachers didn't like that. I was always a bit of an agitator. And I'm a bit of a rule breaker as much as I'm not a people pleaser. I like to do the right thing and I don't like to hurt people's feelings because of the empath side. But I was always an advocate for, you know, the underdogs. So anyone that was getting bullied at school, I would just throw myself in there and, you know, <laughs> usually getting into trouble, not because I was doing something wrong, but I was trying to fend and help others. So that's been a key theme in life is helping others and probably inserting myself in some places that maybe I shouldn't, but it turns out all right in the end. Yeah, fast forward, I grew up in Melbourne, um, yeah, very working class family. Interesting relationship with money, I think, as a kid now, again, just evaluating that as I'm getting older, you know, that whole your money type and your money story. It's been interesting. And again, just spending some time recently with some seriously wealthy individuals, like I'm talking multi, multi billionaires, and just getting an insight into their life and, you know, their happiness or otherwise. It was really fascinating for me and a good kind of reflection point as well for me to kind of re engage uh, my relationship with money and, and working and stuff. So that's been quite good. I went to uni. I was the only person in my family still. I've got younger brothers and sisters and they finished school young. Both my parents didn't finish school. Um, my mum ran away from home at 14, so she had a really fascinating upbringing. You know, she was Irish Catholic. My dad was atheist. So I've always kind of lived and worked in these kind of dualities, I guess, of what you would say is not normal. 
but also, you know, seeing how people exist that have differences of opinion on stuff. And so I think that really goes deep, you know, within my kind of core as well. And hence why I have a podcast that, you know, talks about uncomfortable conversations because I want to understand how other people feel and think about topics that I might have an opinion on and they might think differently to me. So, um, yeah, they, those kind of threads go, go uh, strong. I did PE at university because <laughs> I was an athlete, you know, went to the Institute of Sport and everyone always thought I was going to be a PE teacher, but I knew that that wasn't for me. I didn't want to teach. And then I fell into tourism. I came through university, was a trainer, personal trainer and, you know, aerobics instructor back in the day and uh, landed a job in London and then fell into tourism over there, became a tour guide for Top Tech Travel could write a book about those stories and that set me on the path of tourism which then the rest is kind of uh, you've read some of the bio out so that kind of stems from there. Oh just so much to enjoy in that share. I laughed to myself when you talked about your red and green cordial experience. I was exactly the same Michelle but with grapes. <laughs> so oh wow. My parents had to ban me from grapes because I'd have two or three and I would be like a wild beast just like running and squealing and excitement and just energy and it was exactly the same thing and even today put a grape in me and I, I'd lose the plot. So <laughs> Does that equate into um, wine as well then? Or? Well, I'm sober now. I've been sober for three years, but uh, working in the media industry for as long as I did, uh, I certainly counted a few grapes of the wine variety. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, I have to say I was just as hypo and then just as flat on the floor um, after the hyperactivity wore off. So uh, yeah, I can see a link there, but also a link in your school wasn't for me, statement, mm. I really feel that quite deeply. I, I got out of school and this isn't about me, so this will be a quick one for the listener, but I got out of school as soon as I could, 15. Um, let, me, oh, wow. let me go, let me go work, which is, I think, an interesting route because you sound like you've also, in the same vein as, as, as myself, become a lifelong learner since. Yeah, it's. I mean, you appreciate with tourism, Taz, it's a term we use all the time, that lifelong learners, but that has been me. I've always said I'm a sponge and I think that's probably why I enjoyed school and I'm an absolute social animal, like I, you know, extrovert, I get my energy from others. So I love being around people. So I think that really suited me as well. I was quite smart, but the rote, you know, the sort of format of rote learning or, you know, going over and over something about, you know, more being, if you're good at memorizing stuff, then you'll be good at exams, for example. Whereas I need a need to understand things. I need to understand like, so I delve into the depths, like when I run big companies, even I get into the depths of different parts of the businesses to understand how the workings go. That's how my brain kind of works. And then I go, okay, now I understand how it all works. And then I pull myself out as the you know, managing director or the CEO or whatever, or, or board director. And then I can see quite quickly as we progress through the stages of business, if something's going wrong, I'm like, oh, I know where that is. Because, you know, then I know the inner workings of it. So I can go to the general area a lot faster than if I have no kind of, you know, just an overarching view. But what I've learned in later in life, I think with schools like the Montessori schools or the, you know, the Steiner schools, or I interviewed an amazing woman, Lael Stone, who started her own school, the Woodland Primary School in Melbourne. Those type of schools, I think I would have flourished in because of the way, you know, the, the learning is very different to our mainstream schools now. And I've interviewed quite a number of people that we talk about the whole school system needs to be blown up and the education formatting in Australia needs a real, you know, shake up because it's not, it's still, you know, based on the industrial re revolution. We don't learn like that. We don't work like that anymore. And uh, so we're sort of raising kids and educating young people in life to do things and, and learn in a certain way that it's actually not serving them later in life, in my opinion. I love that you touched on a real cultural um, insight or, or a real curiosity that I have around industrial revolution. And it's one of the reasons I don't drink coffee or alcohol um, is because of hearing some statement somewhere along the line that coffee was invented to get the workers going and the alcohol or the gin at the time was invented to keep them showing up, just keep them down a little bit, you know, just keep them not really high performing a little bit so we can keep them back in this cycle. It really annoyed me and I thought, you know what, this is, no, I am, I am a sovereign individual 
individual and I will not take your industrialization. I will do my own thing. But, you know, that's another entire podcast. <laughs> so we won't get into too much of that. But that's really interesting, Michelle. And I think a lot of people can relate to that process of empowering yourself to, to learn on the job, which you know, you've described in, in some of our pre-research and pre-discussions as being what you've done through most of your extensive career and you're holding positions in the C-suite like that and then moving into to board spaces but also into your own directorship of your own companies. There's so much of learning on the job that I think is discredited uh, and, and how powerful it is to the individual as you grow. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that experience, what it's been like for you, what it looked like and felt like to learn on the job through some of your major positions, but also through being your own business owner. Wow. We could do a whole podcast on just that. If I think about all the different jobs I've done along the way, you know, being open to learning and there's a couple of things. One, just having that openness, I guess, to begin with when you, you know, start something new, when you start your career or you start a business, I'm a curious soul. So it's something I think, you know, my husband would have said about my curiosity kind of annoys him a bit, I think, but I'm always curious about stuff. And so having a curious approach, it's a beautiful position to be in, in in a lot of ways in life, you know, like something, you know, awkward's happening to you, like, oh, instead of putting the shackles up or, you know, someone treated you a certain way, like just have a curious approach about it. Like, why are you feeling like that? What's it making you feel? I think it's a, a really good tool to use, especially for reframing and stuff. So that's the first thing. The other part is actually, you know, never being afraid to ask the dumb questions. And I think, again, as a woman growing up and sort of progressing through a career predominantly in even though tourism, where I've done most of my career for 25 years, there's females are the predominant employees, but in the C-suite, it's still ruled by mostly men. And I've sat on boards now for over 20 years. And the Tourism Tasmania board was a real anomaly in that where we had 60% women Every other board I've sat on, I'm the minority, if not the only woman still today on a couple of the boards I sit on. So um, trying to navigate that sort of space and not feeling stupid enough to say there's a lot of power in saying, actually, I don't understand. Can you explain that a little bit further for me? Or, you know, in cases where like you've come from an agency background, I worked in agency for, you know, eight, nine years. There was a whole other language when I went into that industry. And there were times I'd sit in a meeting. I'm like, man, I run big companies. I was working globally and I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so, and instead of sitting there pretending, you know, it's actually the power in it, calling someone out instead of saying, can you, you know, instead of your marketing speak, could you put that into layman's terms for me, please? Could you put that into plain English so that everyone in the room can understand it? And often I've found that if you are not sure and you don't understand, there's usually someone else in, in the room that doesn't understand either. So be brave about that. And if there is no one else, who gives a shit? Like if you understand it better and you can then make it an informed decision. And if I give you a really good example of that at a very high level, so I've kind of run like that all through my career and always ask questions along the way and not not being shy around, you know, wanting to understand it because then I can bring my full self and add full value is the way I look at it. But an example in um, an ASX board that I sit on, so a couple of years ago, we did a capital raise and that to do a capital raise in ASX is, is a whole new world. I'd never been involved in something like that before. And the chairman of the board knew that this was my first ASX board. So I felt comfortable enough to be really honest and open with him. And so I rang him on this day and I said, look, I don't understand the process. I don't understand the language. I've been sitting in these meetings and it's all kind of going over my head. I'm luckily we're on Zoom, so I can kind of like sneakily, you mm -hmm. know, Google stuff <laughs> as we're going along. What the hell does an Enrio mean? What are the, the whole different financial mechanics of different programs and stuff? And I said to him, I did some research. I contacted ASX. I contacted AICD. I contacted ASIC to see if they had a course to go, how do you learn about fundraising in the world of uh, listed companies and none of them could help me. And so I had to go to him and I said, I need to understand because I don't want to sit around the table and have no idea what we're talking about and when we're making some pretty big decisions about some pretty big money. And he said, first of all, he's like, well, one thing, you know, you're spot on. He said, you have to learn on the job. He said, you can't learn these processes until you go through it. He said, but the second part is good on you for asking the question. He said, because I sit with so many board directors, he said, I'm pretty sure that none of them know what the answer is or they don't fully understand the circumstances and they're signing that off, he said, which is a dangerous position to be in, especially as a director of a listed company. And so that was a beautiful thing and lovely gift that he gave me to, you know, make me 
feel a bit more confident and comfortable about asking him questions in that space. So I was very grateful for that. But it was a really good lesson again to learn to say, ask the question. Don't be shy about that if you don't understand. And if someone explains it and they still you still don't understand, like do some research. These days we've got lots of tools available to us. Or the other thing I started to do was then meet with someone that works in that space, that they work for a big capital raise kind of company, completely separate, no conflict at all. And I just sort of said, can I shout you coffee or a beer? And can I pick your brains for an hour? Because I need to understand this in more depth. And uh, so, you know, take the stand to, to understand stuff a little bit more in business as you start building a business from scratch. There is so many things to learn about and so many trips, I guess, as you are finding out <laughs> that you have along the way. But there's a lot of people you can go to for advice. Lots of people out there that may have done something similar to you or could give you some, you know, little pearls of wisdom out there as well and tons of podcasts to listen to, which are really helpful. I just think that is valuable advice for so, so many reasons. There's an area of business growth that I talk about a lot, which is just the personal undoing that we have to go through is a, a number of areas that get in our way, ego being one of the biggest areas, and that could be a positive and it can be a negative and it can be applied to a number of different things. But where I find it comes into play is the ability to push against often very well established systems that are in a way designed to keep many of us out and uh, the mm. more, I would say, uh, lucky few in. And I do imagine that sometimes the world of capital raising ASX listed companies that may have been very male dominated over the years inadvertently have made these circles kind of small. And it's like, oh, if you know, you know, you, you know, you're in, you're in, which can really play into, you know, as somebody trying to break into that space. And this applies absolutely for business too, an extra layer of fear between your ego and the problem in terms of finding a way mm. to even get the courage to say, I don't know, and to, to deal with whatever comes back. You know, it sounds like you've been really lucky that you've had really open people, but I also think that comes down to your approach and and you not having that egoic fear of not knowing. And I know I think that's one of the biggest things for us. Yeah, I think Kim, but it, when it, it didn't start like that. You know, it's taken a long time. Like people see me as a very outward confident person, but I'm human like everyone. You know, I have doubts. I have times where I feel really, you know, nervous and unsure about things. I mean, another board that I've actually just come off because I became the chair of a charity and I just couldn't do everything. <laughs> so that's been another ASX board that I've sat on for two and a half years. And that was an infrastructure board. And I deliberately uh, wanted to work in a business and an industry that I'd never done before. So I sort of thought, well, I want to challenge myself. I want to see if my skills are transferable and I want to work in a non-tourism base. You know, I don't want to get sort of, you know, stuck in that kind of channel and always people only see me as a tourism expert. So um, this was a major infrastructure company that 3,000 staff and they do things like HVAC, which is ventilation systems and fire, fire services and air and fire for big tunnels and things like that. It's a very different space that I'd ever worked in. And also telco, so you know the connectivity of your Foxtel or NBN and all that type of stuff as well. So this was a really new world for me and I did a lot of research before I joined the company. Then I interviewed all the other board directors and, and got some insights about the business from them as well as obviously reading all the previous documentation before I got in there. And, you know, after the first year I was feeling a little bit, whether it's nervous or just there's a thing about me in life that I dealt with my own mortality at 31. I nearly died and I think when you go through a process and a, an experience like that, you don't want to waste your life on shit. And so that goes into the people that I bring into my inner echelon. I don't suffer fools anymore. I don't have toxic people in my life. I've removed those quite deliberately. And the work I do in life, I want to have meaning. And it might not be this massive big purpose that's going to, you know, necessarily change the world. But in small little ways, I feel like I change the world in a positive way every day. But there is an essence for me that I have to be happy in doing what I'm doing. And I have to feel like I'm contributing. So this particular board, I was like, I don't know if I'm contributing. Like, I don't understand, you know, I don't know the industry as much. I'm the only female and there's like nine blokes sitting around the table. Most of them are lawyers and accountants. And so I wasn't really feeling, but I was asking lots of questions. And so the chairman just 
happened to say we, we happened to run into each other at a Christmas party thing just by chance. And he said, I just want to say like the contribution you're making has been unbelievable. He said, I've been on this board for nine years. And he said, the questions you ask are so different to everyone else. And the way you make us think about stuff so differently, he said, it's just been a breath of fresh air. And it was like, you know, unsolicited. And I was like, wow, thank you so much. Like, I really appreciate that because I wasn't really sure I was actually making a, you know, a good enough contribution. I was a bit nervous about the fact that I'm like, God, do they think that I'm just here as a waste of space? And I think as a woman, you know, with things like quotas and stuff as well, you know, you do sometimes feel like, are they just trying to tick a box? Because if that's it, I'm not, I'm not here for that. You know, I'm here to make a difference and really contribute. I'm not here to just be your quota, kind of tick the box thing because that just that sort of stuff really pisses me off. Yeah, I could absolutely um, understand why and, and relate to that. And um, I think that's a really important message to, to land on. It is about that. And like, can we just have a moment for those people who give us unsolicited feedback? Like, thank you for those people who go and do that, because the impact that that makes is just phenomenal on this journey in terms of reflecting yourself back to you. It's pretty rare and pretty few and far between. So um, yay to that person. Thank you for that. You mentioned there picking something up and putting something down where you felt like perhaps you weren't providing the right value and had too many things on your plate and so had to make a decision about putting that one down um, to move on to. Now, you have a plate that's full with both the responsibility of your board contributions and also the responsibility of your own businesses that you're doing independently. How do you make that decision to know which thing to keep and which thing to put down and why? Uh been trying to learn this you know and relearn unlearn it's been a constant work in progress if I'm honest Kim and because I have a big brain I have a lot of energy and so as uh you know my husband would say when I start another business another business really (laughs) like don't we have enough (laughs) and funnily for me a lot of my businesses have started as sort of you know like hobbies and things that I love that then you know, I just naturally turn into businesses. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just that wired that way, clearly. I can't just make something that's just a hobby. So, yeah, it's, it's a really good thing for me to reflect on. And I think as I'm trying to have a fuller life but not a busier life, I'm getting better at it and I'm getting better at saying no. And I think it's really important, you know, that listening to your gut and listening to your heart when you answer stuff, when someone asks you to do something or to be a part of something, to go just have that brief moment of going within and going, how do I feel about this? Does it make me all tingly and excitable? And like, this is a hell yes. You know, I absolutely would would be so excited to do that. Or is there just going, oh, there's a little bit of doubt. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm just like, oh, there's, you know, too many things going on. So I definitely listen to my gut and as I say, in my heart in that space. And that takes a lot for me to get out of my head. But also, you know, I feel there is only, I do only have finite time and there are certain things that I want to spend more time in. You know, I'm in the studio making, you know, with my hands in clay and making stuff that I love nearly every day. I tend to do all my board work, the podcast and admin and everything else to do with the other businesses in the morning. So I find that that sort of I can power through that, have lunch and then, you know, uh, usually head to the studio after lunch. And I, I do pretty much normally a good seven, eight hours in the studio. <laughs> Sometimes I'll do calls from there as well or, you know, do answer emails and do other work um, if I need to. But that's pretty, most of my days are set up that way. I try and sort of push everything into the morning that I need to sit in the office and do. And as a person that loves flipping from left brain to right brain every day, that really works for me, you know, and it makes the more I do it, the clearer I am about what I want to do, about the things that I want to, that bring joy to me. And also, I guess, being really clear about what you're good at. I think that's another really good exercise to sort of go through and determine, you know, what are the things you're good at? What are you shit at? What are the things you love? And what are the things you hate? It's an exercise I've done with a lot of mentees of mine over the years and got them to really sit and work through those processes to determine, you know, when they're trying to think about what next, what do they want to do next? Sit there and do a process like that, do it on a sheet of paper, write it out as if no one else is going to see it. So you've got to be brutally honest and then you can sit and go through, you know, by yourself or with a mentor or et cetera to sort of work through that. And you start to see some patterns of things that you're really good at and also things that you could then equate into you know, jobs or a career or other um, business opportunities. 
Yeah, it sounds like you have spent a lot of time doing something that I've become quite passionate about over the years, which is getting to know yourself. Now, I'm curious if you've ever delved into human design. Are you a manifesting generator? Oh, good, good guess. I have no idea because I've been following and I listen to a lot of the podcasts, but I, because I don't know the time I've been born. And in the days that I was born, <laughs> in my uh, birth certificate, they don't have the time. And so the hospital that I was born in Melbourne doesn't exist anymore. The record, so I've gone down this whole rabbit hole. And you have to know the time. So I'm still trying to work out how I'm going to do it because I really, yeah, I really rate the human design uh, work and that, that space. It's really interesting. But, yeah, so that is my intent in the next couple of months is to find someone that can help me because both my parents are passed, mm. my grandparents are passed. So I don't have any that reference to even know if it was morning, night. Bit of a tricky one. No, I'm certainly not an expert in that space, but I am a manifesting generator. So I um, resonate with your association of how it feels in your body with a yes or a no and learning to identify where in your body you feel it and, and sort of getting out of your head and, and mm. to be able to make decisions and whether or not that is just a manifesting generator thing or any other aspect you can apply to that. But what I find really interesting about it is you have that awareness now of, of how to make those decisions. And I think that is, yeah, it's a, it's a long-term project to learn that about yourself. And it means that, you know, often we'll hear from someone like yourself or someone like me who will say things like that, you know, listen to your gut. And for us, we're like, yes, yes, yes. It's a hell yes, a body yes, or it's a no. For somebody else, it's like, I do not resonate with that at all. You know, it doesn't it doesn't feel quite right mm. for me. But all of that speaks to, to getting to know yourself and doing the work to do that, which I think is so much of this experience experience. What you do from a career perspective, from a professional perspective is one side, then what you do for yourself is another side. And where I'm getting to with this is you mentioned early on in our chat about your relationship with money and starting to unpack your relationship with money. Now, it's another area that I'm hugely interested in because I have certainly discovered my scarcity complex with money uh, most recently that it comes through hard work and that it's hard to get uh, is kind of a, a something I'm trying to undo in my thinking that that's actually not necessarily true. It's perhaps something that I was programmed with through experiences over the years that hard work equals successful money opportunities. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you've discovered about your own relationship to money? Yeah, would love to. This is something I'm super passionate about and also to, you know, really help a lot of women to get a, a lot more knowledge in this space and to understand their own money story and their own money type. And so what you referred to there is a type known as the worker. So that's, you know, where you have to do the do to get the income to be able to survive. That's, that's a worker type. The four types that I, um, so I went through a program with a dear friend of mine, Melissa Brown, if you know Mel Brown, she has a, an amazing podcast and a whole series. She, if you follow her online, she's hilarious. It's called Mel Brown Money Now. I think she wrote a book. Her first book was More Money for Shoes. Her second <laughs> book was Unfuck Your Finances. And she speaks our language in terms of being, you know, modern day women, you know, navigating complexity in life and what we need to do in terms of being more financially financially literate. And uh, so she does an absolute phenomenal amount of incredible work in that space. I wanted to learn more about shares years ago and I've got a share portfolio that I have a financial advisor manages for me and I wanted to do that myself, typical, you know, going, well, I'm not really convinced with some of your <laughs> some of your decisions. I wanted, I want to learn more about it. And I also wanted to invest in crypto. But interesting, the way I, I work with stuff is because I've earned all my money and every dollar that I've earned in my life is from my own blood, sweat and tears. I, um, I'm not a gambler and I can't, you know, just blow money at the casino and something like crypto for me was like, that's a bit of a gamble. I want to learn more and understand it more before I invest in it. Same as, you know, really with the stock market, to me, it's a, uh, it's a form of legalized gambling is the way I look at it. So you've got to have the money, be willing to lose a bit along the way. And it's all about time in the market versus timing the market. And I think that's a really critical thing for people to learn about if they're going to um, be, invest in those places. So I wanted to learn more in that. Mel had a course and I said to her, I want to do a course on things. She said, yeah, you can do that. But actually 
should do the whole course because it's like you'll learn a ton of it. And Tina, my other mate who helped her build the course, Tina Tower, who helps people with these online courses, is an absolute gun in that space as well. She said, Mel's course is phenomenal. You'd love it. So it's about 900 bucks. I was like, why do I need to do that? My husband's like, why are you paying to do a course on finance when you ran massive companies and you know how it works? And I said, apparently I'm going to learn stuff and I trust these women. And I did. I did. It's an eight week course online. I learned a shit ton. I would recommend anyone to do it. You know what I learned about. So the first thing she starts with is your money story and your money type. And it just gave me some really interesting breakthroughs, honestly, Kim, like to, you know, a couple of little questionnaires. I made my husband do the questionnaires because we are very different. He's quite conservative, whereas I am entrepreneurial, I have always been like, you know, I've owned lots of property, everything I've sort of owned, you know, I make a calculated risk, but there are risks involved. And so it was a really good process to go through to understand that I am a creator is the other type. I can't remember the other two. I just thought I was, my husband's, a, you know, he's the worker type and I'm a creator type. We see money very differently. We see the way we spend, invest, et cetera. And it's been good for our marriage to understand that and to have conversations equally about, you know, what he needs to feel safe and what I need to feel, you know, like that our future safe, because I feel that just having money in the bank to me is not a safe bet. We need to be investing it and looking for the future for different in different ways. So yeah, it's a constant, it's a constant learning for me. The you know, money story, money type was a big one. And then to you know, learn about, I'd never done a full-fledged budget, like a life budget in my life. I'd done little bits of going, oh yeah, let's budget for this. You know, again, when I was younger and I didn't have a lot of money, you know, would budget for certain elements, always knew where my money was in and out, but never sat down and did one. Mel has this enormous spreadsheet, which has all the different components. And so she, you know, wants you to design your life and to determine, you know, if you want to retire by the time you're 50, 60, you know, 70, whatever, how much money are you going to need? What does that look like? And we know now at this point in time that the highest people that are uh, without homes, so have become homeless, are women over 55. There is a thing going on here. And a lot of those women have had quite nice lives, not ever had to worry about money and all of a sudden find themselves destitute. It's pretty concerning. So, you know, a lot of the other women that did the course with me, you know, everyone comes from all walks of life. And it was really eye-opening really eye-opening to be part of that group. I'm part of the alumni now. We're all still connected and um, we all still talk about our stories and the way we're navigating stuff. So yeah, it's important. It's important to not be scared of money. If you can't read a spreadsheet and you don't understand that, you're not dumb. You know, I just sat with someone last week and she's a super smart, incredible businesswoman. Her husband's an accountant and he makes her feel dumb every day. She goes, I can't read a spreadsheet. And I'd say, again, probably like many people that are on the spectrum, that's not their thing. And so it doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means that your brain works differently and there are other ways for you to learn about money. So, you know, go and find what works for you, but just make sure that you understand what's going on in your life, in your business, in your household to be fully aware of the finances within, you know, your realm because it's really important that you do. Yeah, there are just so many ways to get to the outcome that you need, but none of them happen without doing the stuff that you're afraid of and doing the stuff that you're uncomfortable with. And, you know, I can absolutely see how you've applied all of those principles to the growth that you've experienced across your career. And I can imagine that you've probably got a few other business ideas cooking right now out of the Always. things that you're learning. They never stop. <laughs> learning and growing. I'm just to- going on a retreat for a week. Digital detox, that's when all the best ideas come. <laughs> oh, it's a ter- I really have to try to not have too much downtime because, yes, otherwise I will all of a sudden be in a, a position where I'm, I'm doing something else. Um, and that kind of brings me to, I guess, a couple of questions that I want to close us with. There's things like uh, learning about money. There's things like learning to market your business. They're two kind of like major buckets, I would say, in the success of any kind of business that any business owner will go through. It seems to sort of be like one area, like one broad area, or the other. So for you in the growth of your businesses, what area is it that you're leaning into at the moment in terms of learning more? And where do you hope to see your businesses, your ceramics, my gosh, they really are beautiful, your publishing, which I think publishing is just such a beautiful thing to offer to the world. It's such a values aligned place that I'm, you know, hugely passionate about and everything else that you're doing as well. Where do you want to see that grow to? And what will you be focusing on? 
Oh, it's a great question to finish. And I think you just said a point about all the different elements. One of the critical things that you, and I know I'm talking, I'm saying this with myself in mind, is about getting laser focused on, you know, one or two things, because it's very easy for a person like myself to get distracted. And I've had to be disciplined Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do what I do because if I can't be disciplined and concentrate on one thing and, you know, I'm sort of a bit of a digress point, but um, meditation has been massive for me. So when I got sick with cancer at 31, I learned how to meditate just to sort of get through that process. And I've been meditating ever since. And that doesn't, in those days, I did a lot. I did like 20, 30 minutes twice a day. Now I might do five minutes and that's okay. It's probably more of a sense of it's morphed into mindfulness for me. It's around that really being mindful. You know, you can just take a shower in the morning and just like watch your hand washing your arm, be there, be present, be mindful. That's all it takes. So just being conscious of doing that a few times a day. My pottery helps that immensely with me. It's a moving meditation. You know, if I'm on the wheel concentrating on a piece I can't think of anything else because it'll fly off and go make a mess. So um, it's been a game changer. But uh, the question around what am I focusing on and concentrating on, I am trying to double down and really do what I do better or well because I feel like I'm half-assed in a few things. You know, I am from a marketing background, the old classic, I can market everyone else and, you know, do all the work. You know, Amen. The mechanic has the worst car. I feel like my marketing in my business is pretty average at the moment. So I need to concentrate on that. And I've just had a photo shoot done. My website, I'm selling all my stuff on online now for the first time. That all needs to be sort of updated and refreshed. And just, you know, getting the podcast out there more, you know, this beautiful conversations with people and such diverse topics with the one question, you know, it needs to get out broader and I need to do more marketing around that. And so the learnings I can sort of probably express or share with your listeners on that space is it's easy to kind of do the sexy, fun, shiny stuff in a business and everyone will have the thing that they love. Like you talked earlier about you loving data. Some people get in the tangle and love the data part, but forget, oh, whoops, I've got to put my head up and actually talk to others or, you know, get my message out there. Or I love the marketing part, but it's just the follow through. There's, you know, I do five of the 10 things I should do every day with uh, my marketing and I need to get more disciplined with that. So that's what I'm focusing on now. But, you know, having a company, having a business is constant. It's a constant journey. It's not for everyone. And you've also got to learn to be a bit gentler on yourself uh, and, you know, surround yourself with people that are like you. If your mates, you know, my core friends, my girlfriends from school, my brothers and sisters, my husband are very different to me. They're not that entrepreneurial way. So I've had to find my tribe in other ways. And so I have a group, two groups of women that we meet every month. And it's mostly, you know, we're all over Australia, so mostly it's by Zoom. And we have a, you know, a set kind of thing that we kind of go through on each of us and our businesses and one of our challenges and some of our wins. And every one of us is in a different industry. So it's a beautiful connection and we can talk openly about stuff that we're dealing with. But, you know, find your tribe. Even it might might be one person that you can bounce off. Really use that because having a business by yourself is lonely and you you tend to get in your head a lot. So, Mm. um, you know, I'd really advise you to... uh, get out there and find someone that you can, you know, really relate to, but also can help you and you can help them. It's a lovely reciprocal sort of, you know, relationship. Oh, hugely relatable in so many areas <laughs> that you've just shared there. I certainly feel a kindred spirit and you have absolutely shared so much valuable insight um, into your life, your world, your career. And I am hugely grateful for that opportunity to have heard and shared your story today in response to that. And uh, as a thank you, how can the listener and I support you? What can we do for you to help you grow and reach your goals? Oh, Kim, that's lovely. Well, yeah, check out my um, ceramics. That's uh, flung dot com dot au or flung ceramics on instagram and uh, follow me there follow along the fun journey because i haven't really been doing it that long so um, there's lots of failures in that that i share as well which is quite fun fuck up friday i call it because <laughs> it usually is it happens every week and uh, follow the other podcast so obviously this is a beautiful one to listen to and i've really enjoyed you know so many of your guests like adam ferrier i love that interview mary dwyer some really big fans of those people that you've had on the show so you're you're doing a wonderful job here him and um you know if if someone wants to listen to a uh, a slightly different podcast as well mine's called one question i ask people if there's one thing that they wish society would talk more about what would it be 
And so the topics are so varied and uh, we cover everything and anything, but uh, that would be amazing to have more listeners on that. So thank you. Absolutely. And the listener knows how obsessed I am with podcasts and how much I believe in the medium and how much I believe in supporting each other and collaboration over competition always. I love your pod. I listen. I will make sure the link is in the show notes as with the link to Flung and everything and anything else I can find on you will be in the show notes. So um, listener, get around those. And Michelle, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It's been my absolute pleasure. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Kim. You ha- you ask as a person that uh, has a podcast, you, it's always lovely to get on the other side and you ask such wonderful, insightful and really interesting questions. So I appreciate that because, you know, you get to delve into, you know, a person very differently than other people may get to hear. So uh, well done and mm. keep, keep at it. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. Means more than you know. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.